Hello and welcome everybody to the Soybean Innovation Lab uh, Small Mechanization Webinar Series. This is the third of our series. Uh, the first two webinars were given in um, May and June and you can see uh, from the slide that you're looking at that those are archived on the Soybean Innovation Lab website so that you can go and uh, see both the PowerPoints and the presentations that were given. Uh, today uh, we have two um, entrepreneurs, two startups, uh, along with Purdue University, they're gonna, going to speak. Uh, first, we'll have Elliot Avila with Amara Tech, and second, we will have Dr. John Lumpkis and David Wilson, who are with Purdue University and um, Mobile Ag Power Solutions. Oh, trying to move my... Okay, so the reason the Soybean Innovation Lab started this webinar series is because agriculture innovation and mechanization in Africa lags behind many other continents. And we know that machinery is a key agricultural input and market enabler for intensifying agriculture. Some of the constraints that we've seen in Sub-Saharan Africa include affordability, availability, of difficulty with um, farmer skills, private sector constraints, and also gender issues. So in today's the webinar, um, Amartek will give the first presentation. If you have questions, you can type them into the question panel as the talk proceeds. And at the end of the presentation, the questions will be read to the presenter for them to give answers. And then Purdue University and Mobile Agricultural Power Solutions will give the second presentation. We'll use the same format for the questions and answers. So now I would like to go to Elliot Avila from Amartek. Hi everyone, uh, hoping you all can hear me and that my connection does not get dropped soon. Um, I'm calling in from Tanzania and Arusha. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about Imaratech. Imaratech is a... Uh, ooh. Imaratech is a Tanzanian-based startup that manufactures agricultural technology for use on smallholder farms. Um, agricultural technology such as this crop thresher which you can see here in this first slide. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my entrepreneurial journey as well as um, go over what Imartech's business model is, uh, some of the challenges we face, how we create impact, uh, and where it is that we're going in the next few years. So to start off um, about myself, I grew up in the suburbs outside of Los Angeles, uh, so no agricultural background. In 2010, I moved to Boston, Massachusetts to attend MIT where I studied mechanical engineering. And when I got to MIT, I was very unsure of what it was that I wanted to do, uh, but I heard about this program there called MIT D-Lab, which some of you may have heard of before. Uh, but MIT D-Lab is MIT's technology uh, program for international development. Uh, so I took a class there in fall of 2011 and ended up traveling to India uh, with that class in January 2012 to work on a solar dryer project and not much came out of that project actually but that was a really influential trip for me um, and one of the things that happened on that trip was I remember having this great discussion with uh, my trip leaders and they were expressing a lot of frustration in uh, uh, in, in projects being started but in not having the sort of continuity and the follow through to take those projects uh, and execute them and get that impact that initially started those projects. So that sort of drove me back to India the following summer. Um, I continued working with the same organization and it also led me to take another D-Lab class the following year as a junior and in January 2013 I traveled with that class to Tanzania for the first time. Um, we were working on a project to do with bicycle powered mace shellers which you may have come across before. Um, but essentially this organization we were working with had a lot of mechanical failures of these May shellers. So me and a student team that I was working with, uh, we diagnosed the problem, we came up with a quick technical fix for it, um, we brought it out to the field and our last couple of days there to implement. Um, and we tested it and it was going great. Uh, our solution worked. Um, and we brought it to the farmer that we were testing with and we asked them what do you think of this 
um, you use this, no. Um, and they told us that what, what they do is they just call up this guy. So we had uh, the farmer call up this guy that you see in this picture here. He drove up on his motorcycle, and on the back was this big orange machine. Uh, he took it off, started it up, and started dumping buck buckets of maize into the machine and uh, shelled all of their maize in about 15 minutes. So that was pretty incredible. Um, it was a little bit of a dumbfounding moment for us. We weren't quite sure what to do with that. Um, and I would like to say that that was when we realized the potential for nice real service models. Uh, but it took us a while longer. Uh, I ended up working with that same organization again the following summer. Uh, and they had received an exploratory grant from the Gates Foundation to create a labor-saving thresher for smallholder women farmers. Um, so I was hired back sort of as the, the lead engineer for this project. Um, and I would have to say that it was a pretty naive project for us in a lot of ways. Um, we didn't have a lot of agricultural background experience on our team. Uh, we had a really preliminary human-powered thresher concept that we were working off But I traveled back to Tanzania and we developed some uh, human powered threshing prototypes like the one that you see in this. We, brought to farmer. we were testing them with farmers and we asked them, well, what do you think of this? And they told us, that's really nice, uh, but we honestly expected a lot more. Um, but maybe we're still going to buy your machine, but we're the first thing we're going to do is put an engine on it. And so us, for us, that was a really eye-opening uh, experience because on one hand, you know, this human-powered threshing machine that you see in this picture was out of the price range for the smallholder women farmers that we were trying to target who had purchasing power of maybe a couple dollars. Um, but the people who could afford them machine wanted something much better. And for the cost of putting an engine on our machine, the machine became 10 times better. Um, and if people wanted that, then we decided maybe that's the direction that we have to go. Uh, so we left the project at that. I returned to MIT, graduated in 2014, um, and found my way back to Tanzania uh, as an unrelated thing, but was hired again by that same organization to continue working on this threshing project and see it out through the rest of the year. So I spent uh, that year, two, 2014 to 2015, um, working on engine-driven, multi-crop threshing uh, prototypes. And at the end of the year, it was a little unclear about where this project would go. Um, we knew that, that we had a technology that people uh, were very interested in. We knew that we had a product on the technology, but we suspected that there was a lot more that we could be doing, a lot of improvements that could be made to make this desirable product even better. Um, and to sort of looking back on that conversation that I had on that India trip a few years before, um, I wanted to see this place as uh, next, continuing to refine our technology design and uh, you know conduct a market pilot, but also really develop business models. Um, and 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 plan for for the future of this and see how can we turn this into a you know scalable sustainable venture um, and so out of that year was born Imara Tech uh, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, what Imara Tech is and what it is that we do so to start off with uh, Imara Tech's vision is that we aim to improve access to mechanized agricultural equipment for smallholder farmers across sub-Saharan Africa um, and so this is a very sort of ambitious vision in a lot of ways, um, but we see just that a lot of things hinge on improving the efficiency, improving the lives of smallholder farmers, um, that smallholder farming is tied into poverty alleviation and it plays a big role in food security, uh, in employment, in gender issues, uh, it, it's going to have it's it's going to be a, a factor in considering environmental sustainability. Um, so all these things hinge around around these smallholder farms, and and we want to 
develop those farms, give them access to the technology that improves farmers' lives. Uh, so it's not just me doing this. I have two co-founders um, committed to this vision as well. One is Alfred Cengula. Uh, he's a Tanzanian from southern Tanzania and really in a lot of ways embodies the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, when he was younger, he started his own uh, small keychain making business and uh, was selling keychains in three different countries. Around East Africa. Um, also, we have a technology expert with us, Adriana Gartiz, just after from Austin, um, and she spent the last couple years working here in Tanzania, uh, working on different human-centered design projects and agricultural technologies, and she's really interested in the manufacturing part of our business. Uh, to give an overview of what Imara Tech does, um, Imara Tech establishes workshops in country, and from those workshops we produce agricultural equipment, such as multi-crop threshing machines. Um, for our multi-crop threshing machines, we sell those to rural entrepreneurs, is what we call them. Those are our customers, and they're going to buy the machine and run it as a service business. And the service business is... for that service because they have uh, reduced labor and, um, and it improves their lives. So to talk a little bit about our technology, uh, so our multi-crop threshing machine, we're trying to reach a target sales point of $700. For now, we're really considering um, bumping up the price to $1,000 in our initial years as we bootstrap ourselves and get ourselves off the ground. Uh, we're doing about 3,000 kilograms per hour of maize. Uh, 600 kilograms per hour of rice, 800 kilograms per hour of sorghum. Uh, maize has been the crop that we focus on the most because such, it's such a staple crop here in Tanzania. Uh, and we're really trying to improve the throughput of our other crops before uh, we start selling those as, uh, as part of what our machine can do. Um, but we've built in the multi-crop functionality by swapping out the concave of the machine. So swapping it out changes the sieve hole size. It also changes the clearance between the beaters uh, and, and that concave. We have a small blower for winnowing, um, but it's a very simple machine. And you can see here uh, that these machines are made out of mild steel, uh, sheet metal, angle, iron, uh, flat bar. These are things that uh, are very easily found in places like Tanzania. Um, and that is important to us, it's not only because we're manufacturing here, but if our products break outside of their warranty, someone should be able to fix it. Um, really the only specialty parts that we have on here are we have some shafts, we have pulleys, uh, we have bearings, we have an engine, and it's a six and a half horsepower petrol engine. Um, so that that's our crop threshing machine. Let's talk a little bit about where those are made. Uh, we make those at workshops, as you mentioned, have a distribution and that means like tens of million. Uh, we're setting up 10 to 15 of these workshops around the country pr to produce these, each one serving a population of about two to three million people um, and producing between 500 to 1,000 of these machines per year. And that's a level that would allow us to be sustainable. Um, this sort of decentralized production, we see it having a lot of benefits. Um, for agricultural equipment like crop threshing machines often see that those tend to be manufactured in scale abroad in places like China and India. And that distance between that factory maybe in China and the smallholder farmer in rural Tanzania off 50 kilometers of dirt road um, and 1,000 kilometers from the nearest port uh, creates a lot of problems. So it's not just the distribution costs. You know, These machines have a, a big footprint, a big shipping footprint, but their price density is very low. Um, it's also, it's hard to make those sales. It's hard to get out there to where the people actually need this. There's a big trust issue between these farmers and these foreign manufacturing companies because they don't know who to go to uh, if they have a problem. But our model, which puts us a little bit closer in the center of these major agricultural zones, um, give, gives them some sort of confidence that if, they're, if, if something really does go wrong, uh, someone can be held accountable. It also means that we have you know, not only a sales force based out of these places, um, but we, can, we also have a trained staff who is knowledgeable on how to conduct repairs of these. 
uh, machines in case anything happens with them. Um, so after we make these, we go and we sell these machines. And we sell them to people uh, like this guy you see in this picture here whose name is Jose. And Jose... lives in Mbeya in southern Tanzania. Um, and our customer profile with it's uh, are what we call rural entrepreneurs because they're really sort of hustling in a lot of ways. They're working multiple jobs. Maybe it's as laborers. Maybe they have a small shop. They're also working on the farm. Jose uh, makes furniture and runs his own sort of small taxi business. Uh, but they're looking for new income streams and they're looking for new ways that they can make money. And guys like Jose are also tend to be uh, better connected and they have some sort of access to capital. So J Jose has his own motorcycle and for us that's a good sign that Jose could then afford our machine. Um, so we sell our MCTR crop thresher to guys like Jose uh, with financial support. So we're looking at trying to offer it 50% uh, on loan. Um, Jose's going to buy the machine. He, he buys it and he puts it on his motorcycle on the back and he's going to carry this machine around uh, to the villages in his region, um, to farms in the area, and he's going to take off the machine, set it up, thresh people's crops, and they're going to pay him for it. And Tanzanian farmers are, are willing to pay a little less than 50 cents per 100 kilogram sack of maize uh, or grain that is threshed. Uh, and because we're doing three tons per hour, that means Jose is earning $14 an hour from his threshing business. Um, and $14 an hour is a really, really good wage. That's double the U.S. federal minimum. Um, that's a great daily wage here in Tanzania. And as far as an hourly wage out in the rural villages, uh, it's pretty astronomical. Um, but that high wage that Jose can earn gives him a financial incentive to return markets and serve more people. Um, and we estimate that Jose can... Uh, you know, serve maybe 50 two-acre farmers um, and make his money back for the machine. So the question is, uh, who's paying for this and why are they paying so much uh, money? And it's six million smallholder farms in Tanzania um, could use a service like this. And we found a lot of demand from those farmers for an improved crop threshing service like the one Jose could provide. And they're willing to pay for it because it saves them so much time and so much labor. Um, instead of three hours of beating maize with a stick to get one single sack, uh, our crop threshing machine can do that in two minutes. Um, and we've surveyed uh, a lot of our end users, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, but they were saying to us that they were spending their time um, keeping shops open, tending to, to their other farms or their other jobs that they had around the house, uh, running informal businesses like selling food, and sometimes just spending time with their family. Um, but that sort of 50 cents per sack is worth it to them. And I probably don't have to convince a lot of you um, why, why this threshing service can be so important. Um, we have some secondary benefits such as grain quality and decreased losses that we, we're hoping sort of come through with our, with our machine as well, but it's uh, that's less certain at this point and we're, we haven't sort of fully defined what that would be yet. Um, so to talk about what we've done, we've sold 20 of these crop threshing machines uh, in the last two years or so. Last year it was 15 as part of a small market pilot that we did mostly in southern Tanzania. Um, and this year we sold about another five and we're working on some more at the moment. Um, and from these we've got gotten a lot of uh, great feedback. Uh, what people have told us so far, the main problem that we've had has been uh, mechanical failures of the machine resulting in sort of last minute design changes uh, that weren't fully thought out. So material failure. But when we addressed those technological issues, those small technological issues, uh, people were very overwhelmingly positive. Uh, not just the customers who were buying the machine and running it as a business, but also the smallholder farmers. So we did this user survey where we talked to 30 of the farmers that had paid for the service um, to try and figure out why they were doing it. And like I said, it was to spend time with their family. Um, to go back to something I mentioned earlier, we originally set out to impact these women farmers. Um, and what we found is that about 
of the threshing that we see being done uh, is done by women. So the reduction in labor uh, is overwhelmingly sort of uh, a reduction in labor for women farmers, which is a positive. Um, but also what was good that came out of that survey was that we saw that, that even though typically it's head of household and they control uh, and oftentimes sort of that final purchasing uh, decision making, um, to pay for this service, uh, it often was sort of a split uh, unanimous decision amongst the household. So, uh, so men, even though they're involved, are, are still willing to pay for this and, and reduce labor for their wives or for their, their daughters or their mothers. Um, and again, we've we've had really strong customer interest. It's one of those things that uh, the market is definitely there for for better crop threshing machines. To talk a little bit about the challenges that we face, um, a lot of our business model is still yet untested. So this manufacturing line, this manufacturing at scale, we haven't been able to do that so much. At the end of the day, for us, 20 machines made is a good step. Uh, but if, if we were starting very small, we would be making less than 100, and we would intend to scale production of a single site to 500 or 1,000 machines per year. Um, so we need to, to bridge that. Uh, a big challenge surrounding this kind of business is that we have a really short window of opportunity to make sales of these machines. So farmers are only willing to buy or really seriously consider buying a machine like this in the month leading up to the harvest season uh, because they aren't going to invest 700 won't need for six months in case they need that money. Um, so we have to uh, make the sales during that time but also accurately gauge uh, the level of demand for our product. It would be really bad if we made 500 machines and only 50 people wanted them, and it would be equally bad if we made 500 machines and 1,000 people wanted them. Um, and then another one of our challenges for us is just that we are uh, a young team. We're incredibly ambitious, we're driven, and we're really committed to this, um, to this vision of Imara Tech, but in a lot of ways we lack some of the corporate experience of uh, seasoned businessmen and businesswomen, and, um, and, and those are things that we hope to improve. So looking at sort of our next steps, um, my core team is looking at you know a lot of sort of professional development in the next year or two. Um, so I've started recently working with a solar company doing technology design with a B because they're in the transition sort of out of this startup zone to having 500 or 1,000 employees. Um, and there's a lot of uh, insights to learn from, from seeing another business go through that. Uh, things that we can take with us uh, on our journey and implement so that way five years down the line we don't look back and say, well, we wish we had done this one very simple thing when we started off which would have made everything better. Um, one of the things that we've learned from being immersed in not only the sort of East African business environment but also social enterprise uh, environment and also just startup environments is that uh, it's not enough to just have a really a, a good idea or a good vision. Um, there's a thousand ways that you can fail outside of that. And so we really want uh, to be the right people to lead that. Um, and to anticipate the pain points and avoid them. Um, so we're also, when we're, do, we're doing this and the me still are other. Um, still producing machines and getting feedback uh, and, and making design improvements. Um, we're looking to strengthen our networks and our partnerships, so we're at this unique point where we can really be a little flexible about um, and, and experiment with different things uh, before we get locked into a much bigger, uh, slower moving business. Um, and we know that strong partnerships take a long time to build. So those are some of the things that we're doing now. Um, and we're looking to fundraise, uh, launch, you know, we've started, but we really want to launch at a big level. Um, we have this ambitious vision to not just be across Tanzania and East Africa, but eventually Sub-Saharan Africa. And we want to begin that journey in earnest. 
um, we want to scale and we want to create that impact that we set out to achieve. Do you have any questions? My email is I'm happy to put you in touch with some more info uh, on our website, which is imaratech.co. Thank you all. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, we had a little trouble hearing you at times, but I think we did end up hearing the entire thing. Um, so we're going to go to questions now. And so I will read off the questions. Um, Elliot, I don't know if you want to turn your camera back on. Yeah, I can turn my camera back on. And uh, um, oops. OK, we can see you. Um, OK, let me start with the questions. Okay, uh, let's see. We have um, what is your, what's the typical charge structure for the threshers? Do they do cash or in kind or a percent of crop or what do they do? Uh, I'm going to assume that that means uh, what are the smallholder farmers paying yeah. the rural entrepreneurs? Well, I'll answer them both. Yeah, okay, so people are paying cash for that usually. Um, and and what we've seen is that people often Oftentimes, just sort of estimate how many uh, sacks of grain they did, so it's not they uh, three times. Just knows the amount looks like um, and this guy's Um. Okay. So we actually couldn't hear that answer. Uh, can you try one oh. more time? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, essentially, in short, uh, people are paying cash for. A, for the service, for the threshing service. Okay. And the next question is, um, so we have a comment uh, that this is a great model to deliver this kind of technology. The question is, maize threshing leaves behind a lot of crop residue, for example, cobs, sheaths, etc. Have you thought of working on feed chopping? Uh, yes, we have thought of working on feed chopping. Um, again, Imara Tech is not just interested in only threshers, we're also interested in really uh, developing a full line of agricultural technologies, mechanized ones, um, that we could sell and, and bring to smallholder communities. So eventually down the line, right, maybe we are selling a feed chopping machine to the same entrepreneur that, that bought money and uh, that bought our crop threshing machine and earned the money and now this is another business that they run. Um, right now, not a lot's being done with, with those leftover residues, uh, but it's some that we're interested in moving. Okay, and the next question is? I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope that my, my sound is working. Yeah, it kind of fades in and out, but I think we, we do, it, we, we have a delay on you, actually, so we hear it, but it comes a little bit later than we see your mouth moving. Um, Okay. Okay. Uh, um, what other implements are most requested by farmers? Um, that's a hard one. Um, we see uh, we see a lot of. It really depends on the region. So when we were down in the south, there were a lot of people um, asking about peanuts. Uh, and we've had a lot of people asking about uh, pearl millet threshers because pearl millet is really hard for them to do. Um, and there's a big potential for bean threshers, um, which is something that is maybe not quite right for our machine and might require something slightly different. Uh, but it's it's a difficult sort of question between um, a lot of people request pearl millet threshers because pearl millet's hard, uh, but that doesn't mean that that's the next best technology for us to make. It would really depend on is there a market for it. Uh, um, also, is our, our model is based around someone running it as a business and earning money off of it. So if some 
someone can't earn money off of running a Perl mill at Thresher, it might not make sense for us because it, that might mean that uh, you know no one that we're trying to target could afford the machine or afford to invest in it as a business vehicle. Okay, um, Elliot. Uh, so, um, I have one comment on that and then add to that question a little bit. Um, so my comment is that Compatible Technology International, who did our first webinar, does do Pearl Millet Threshers. So um, you guys might want to get with them. Uh, then the, it was actually Horace Clemens who asked that question about other implements. And um, Horace is going to give the seminar, the webinar next month. Uh, and it's going to be on the Ogun tractor, which is an open source tractor. So I think he was probably referring to uh, implements, for, you know, like planting beyond threshers. Have you, have you heard people voice opinions about planters, um, uh, you know, discs, anything like that? Um, we keep we keep our ears open for those. Probably my Tanzanian co-founder could better answer that question. Um, because mostly what we're doing is we're looking at uh, we're, we're keeping our eyes open but we aren't really actively seeking that feedback and people don't necessarily offer it to us uh, in a meaningful way they see us as the crop and for now at least for the next couple of years that probably is just what we need so what is the tractor situation in Tanzania? Are, do most people prepare land? Are there tractors provided by service providers? Uh, tractors really, I don't see them as being very common. Um, and you, uh, when you do come across tractors, they tend to be owned and operated by a single farmer on a much larger farm. Um, so you have in some cases around Arusha you might have more which is which is to the north and near Nairobi uh, so a lot more sort of uh, influx of imports and and people and organizations working with farmers here this area uh, power tillers and these small walking tractors um, but even that I would say is not that common um, In some cases, yes, you, you, you do come across uh, a tractor beast uh, and this must tend to be, you know, for someone's 200 acre farm that they own and they don't have any interest in uh, running it as a business in their community because it's not worth their time to do that. Okay, thank you. And um, let's see, the next question is, have you done soybean threshing and what was the throughput you achieved and also what is the weight of the thresher? Uh, we have not done soybean threshing yet. Um, so we, in our initial year that we took on this project, what we tried to do was we tried to get sort of a minimum viable uh, throughput of a couple different crops. So we looked at uh, a staple crops really, and, and for that we looked at rice, wheat, sorghum, and maize. Um, and then we got those to, you know, about 800 kilograms per hour of maize. Um, and that was our best one, but but then we spent the next year focusing only on maize, and and that number jumped up to 3,000 kilograms per hour, um, and and that's probably how we're going to approach this in the future is is to slow sort of slowly take on, and you know this year we're we're doing more intensive R and D into can we get better throughput with with rice and sorghum would be the next two that we look at, and then the next year we would take on okay maybe it's pearl millet and 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 soybean that time, um, but it's going to be a sort of incremental uh, implementation of those next crops, but with the capacity to to do those in our existing machines built built into the machines that we sold already. Okay, the next question is, how do you organize for after-sales service of, services of the machine, example when there's a repair or the, a breakdown? Yeah, so that's a good question, um, and that's again one of those challenges that I talked about that our business model remains untested in a lot of ways so when you're uh, running a small market pilot as the startup um, which 
with what we did last year, uh, those in the field services were done by myself and my co-founder uh, and by one or two uh, technicians operating in the area. Um, and that's something that we're, we have ideas around it. We think that what we can do is partner with uh, sort of local workshops in these what we call junction towns, which would be the connecting point between, you know, 10 different villages. Um, and that's, those are the areas where the middlemen operate um, and the middlemen tend to be our target customers. So we're finding them there. Uh, and in those places we think, okay, maybe we can partner with the small workshop here, um, train them on how to repair our equipment uh, and and cover the costs and pay for that service. So if someone has a problem, they would bring it to that junction. And if it was a much more serious problem, then they would bring it to sort of the regional uh, regional center where where we were doing the major manufacturing. But we'll see how that actually plays out when we get to a much bigger level. Okay, can you elaborate further what you mean what you meant by material failure and what did you specifically do to solve it? Yeah, so we, uh, one change that was made during our production this year that we didn't make before was our rotating drum. Before we had made out of a two millimeter sheet metal rolled tube. Um, and this year, to save time, uh, our technicians uh, went out and instead of rolling sheet metal, they bought uh, a big pipe. And the pipe was uh, six millimeter thick. Um, so it was a it was a much heavier piece than what we were used to, um, even though in some other cases we had actually you know changed the thickness of the material um, in certain points from two millimeters to let's say one and a half, and so we suddenly had a much heavier rotating drum, um, and it was throwing maize hitting maize really hard. Uh, and in some cases hitting it and there was these weak points where the steel uh, just got shredded by, by a maize cob. So obviously that was a really big problem for us. Um, and what we had to do was, was go back and those first couple machines that we sent out there, um, we had to recall them, bring them to a workshop, uh, change the material thickness, cut it down in some places, reinforce it in others, uh, and also adjust that for the next 10 machines that we were sending out that year. Uh, the next question is, do you offer any credit products to your customers? Uh, by credit products, I, what we're trying to do is we're trying to offer financing to them. Um, in the case of, we're, when we're thinking 50%, um, that they would put 50% up front and then would be expected to pay back the other 50% uh, over the course of, of the year. But really that, that harvest season is when they should be paying it back. Um, that's, that's the only sort of credit that we do, but we don't want to actually be a microfinance institution. There are other institutions that do this, uh, have been doing this for much longer, are obviously much better at it than we would be uh, and, and we would hope to be working with them to develop a system of, of having them handle, handle that credit uh, to our customers. Have you had any issues with people not paying back the other 50%? Um, yeah, we, we had a couple. Um, so far, it, I, would say, so it, I would say it's been really good so far. Um, the main, some of the people that didn't pay us back, I think there were three that were, uh, are still telling us that they're going to pay us back. <laughs> um, but a year later, it's, it's a little slow to have that money come in. Um, but part of the reason we think for that was last year we were uh, a little bit late in the harvest season um, to get our machines out there. So some of our customers received them about halfway through the harvest season and they didn't get that full time period uh, to recoup their investment and run it as a business, uh, which is really disappointing and again goes to this, uh, one of the difficulties of this business model um, is that if you miss the harvest season, it might be an entire another year before you can make that sale again. Um, and if, and for our customers, it might be another year before they actually can earn that money that they intended to get um, 
and and pay off their loan or, or do whatever else with it that they wanted to do. Right. Um, so somebody would like to know if you're documenting the various business models that you use. Uh, as <laughs> I'm I'm taking that question as it as in are we documenting sort of the revisions um, to our business model as we go? Uh, we have a lot of working documents that uh, are not necessarily well organized or shareable in a meaningful way with other people. Um, but yeah, our, our business model goes through revisions. I mean, a lot of this is, is just sort of my co-founders co and I talk about this stuff all the time and, and it's, it's more of something that we just know rather than we have to write down all the time. But we're playing with all these different things. Right now we're looking at, uh, looking at to address this sort of short window of demand. Um, can we leverage existing sort of small workshops and have a much much more flexible manufacturing line um, but we'll see that that's what these next two years are for and and yeah I, I guess I guess it could go through and look back at the old business models but usually they were changed for a reason and it's not worth it so um, I'll put in a little plug for the mechanization network. That's one of the things that, um, you know, as people like your organization has these experiences and other people can learn from them that, we'll, you know, we can work together put, posting that on the mechanization network webpage so that it's accessible to people and, and we don't all have to repeat the same mistakes or learn the same lessons. Yeah, I would, I would be happy to share some of, some of our failures and some of the thought processes that we went through um, and to, to get where we are today. Um, there is another question about credit financing. Um, okay, somebody asked, do farmers pay for the post-harvest services in cash or commodity? And you already answered that it was cash. Um, so they, they uh, w can you comment any more? Uh, you had mentioned to me that some of the uh, solar power companies were doing some financing, that you were thinking about working with them. Can you comment on that a little bit more? Yeah, so uh, so Arusha is where we're based is really a hotbed of uh, solar company startups, and a lot of these companies are very interested right now um, in these productive use technologies such as uh, these crop this crop threshing machine and other agricultural equipment, um, and so they've been reaching out to us a lot to see um, if there's potential to. Uh, run our machines on solar um, or there and they have some interesting payment mechanisms um, so the company I'm working with right now is Mobisol and I'm looking at these agricultural technologies with them for solar and they have a pay-as-you-go mechanism um, where customers can send in money through their cell phone uh, and make payments like that and when things go wrong or they aren't paying, Mobisol can track where their technology is and go and pick it up and recoup it. Um, so that is something that, you know, we'll see how it how it plays out, um, but there is a lot of potential for us to partner with, with solar companies on the technology in, a, in different ways, whether it's that pay-as-you-go mechanism or whether it's uh, solar power for, for the equipment that we produce. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, one person commented, have you thought of introducing a hitch to your design so that it can be towed behind the motorcycle rather than being put on top of the motorcycle? Um, also, somebody yeah. wants to... Uh, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, we've considered that. Um, <laughs> so that might, that might be a design change that happens. For, for us, the real, the real key, and we... Uh, to me, the... the machine on the back of the motorcycle is, I mean, to me it seems a little precarious, uh, but I have another picture of Jose and another person and the machine on the motorcycle around these back roads, and for him it works fine. Um, and what matters is really, can you get the crop threshing machine out there to the field to where the customer is? If you're doing crops like rice, the threat happens in the middle of the field and it has to happen quick. Um, you can't transport your rice or you don't it's not ideal to transport your rice to where the machine is the machine should go there and a motorcycle is the best way but maybe a hitch is uh, a safer and 
more reliable solution. Um, somebody wants to know how many months and hours can a rural entrepreneur operate the multi-crop thresher in a year in monomodal and bimodal rainfall areas in Tanzania? Um, so I would say uh, typically, typically most most regions of the country have one harvest season, um, and that harvest season lasts for four to six weeks. Um, and so that's that's our target is that with our machine you could uh, make your money back and and at fourteen dollars an hour and a seven hundred dollar price point that's fifty hours of operation uh, that you've earned your money back and then anything that we can do on top of that is is just even better um, so if there's rice and maize there in that area and the entrepreneur has um, both capability for their machine, right? They can potentially earn, uh, you know, maybe 50% more income that harvest season. Um, and I would say that when there's two harvest seasons, the the second one tends to be smaller, uh, maybe about 50% the size of the other one, uh, in terms of, you know, amount of crops grown or harvested. Okay. And um, somebody wanted you to repeat the price of the machine. It's a uh, seven hundred dollars is our price is our target price point, um, and that's the price that we've been selling at. We are seriously considering bumping that up to about a thousand dollars, and this is inclusive of the, the engine and everything. Um, but we're considering bumping it up to a thousand dollars because, based on the feedback we've gotten from people, the price isn't uh, a deterrent to them purchasing the machine. What's their biggest concern right now is is there repair? Is there a warranty? Is it actually going to work um, as as we said it did? And the reason to bump it up to that thousand dollar price point would also be because uh, there's just a lot, of, a lot of different barriers for us at this stage. We don't have the economies of scale to drive our costs down for our customer. But we on our models, we've we've predicted that we can drive it down to be financially sustainable at a seven hundred dollar price point. Okay, I'm going to do one last question. Um, so, uh, let me see. How, are some of your machine ideas proprietary? Have you had the need to work with or around patents? Uh, yeah, so we, we are working with patents, um, but I would say a lot of these things, uh, it, it's, a, it's at the end of the day, a crop threshing machine is a really old, Technology, the the technological innovation uh, of our that you see in our machine is, in my eyes, a pretty small uh, part of the whole thing. And that what's much more, um, what will make us succeed is is not a, the best crop threshing design or, or something new and crazy in our crop threshing machine. It's a hundred hundred year old, hundred fifty year old technology. Um, in some ways, but it's going to be the innovations in what we're doing with the manufacturing and the innovations in the supply chain and in our business model. Uh, and that's going to be what I see as really uh, driving this potential to, to bring technologies to people. Um, that's, that's the much... Now, what I've told you is is everything that we're trying to do in those areas. So, um. okay, thank you, Elliot. And I want to wait, make one more comment that there are several people that have um, shared questions or comments that they're interested in um, your machine, its in its capabilities, and so uh, we will. Uh, uh, um, I don't, Elliot, you want to share one more time your email, but we can also send that out to everybody in our follow-up email so that you can contact Elliot directly if you would like to work with Imara Tech. And yeah, that'd be great. My email is just uh, avila.elliot, A-V-I-L-A-L-L-E, -L -L um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions or talk, to, talk about any of this more. Okay. Thank you, Elliot, Elliot, and thank you all for your questions. And um, uh, so um, 
we will uh, be sending out a follow up e follow up email, and we will give you guys um, both Elliot and David's um, email uh, contact so that you can contact them directly. So now we are going to move on to um, Dr. John Lumpkis and David Wilson, who are with Purdue University, and David is also with Mobile Ag Power Solutions. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hello, David. All right. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we do. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah, so as Carrie said, I'm David Wilson. This is John Lumpkis. And do you have our video as well? No, I think you need to turn on your – there you go. We can see you now. All right. So uh, we're here at Purdue University, and we'll be talking about some of our projects here at Purdue. And then uh, the business maps that I started out of some of the projects we've been working on here. So um, I'll let John take the first part of this presentation. Yes, so as David said, welcome everyone and thank you for attending, whether it's your morning, uh, afternoon, or evening. And I'm just going to give a very quick background of kind of what led to the development of the company. And um, David's been involved from that pretty much from the beginning. As you'll see, I don't want to take too much time. I'll turn it over to David, who's um, becoming surpassing me in many respects on, on the project aspects, and, and you'll get to see what he's been doing. The project started in 2008. We were actually approached by an NGO in Cameroon through uh, uh, mutual colleagues asking us to get involved in a uh, problem of rural transportation they had. And so it was kind of unique. I had done some similar vehicle work with students at both the former university and at Purdue, uh, but had never done any work in Africa or even in um, uh, international context. So we started, we formed a team, started working on a vehicle design uh, through a lot of Skype calls and um, conference calls, emails. And about halfway through the project, they invited us. This would have been early 2009, so why don't you just come visit us in May um, and uh, see what we're working with. And so we took a team of students there in May 2009, and that, that I would say was uh, transformational both for me and the students, and really started the project at Purdue. So over the next really three or four years, 2010, 11, 12, 13, we, we worked on a kind of a new iterative design each year, brought it to Cameroon, built it with the uh, NGO, and got feedback throughout the year. And as the vehicle kind of matured and other people saw what we were doing, there started to be requests for purchasing it. Can we buy these? Can you make extra ones? Um, and so we kind of started looking at uh, what the options were to work with our NGO to, to produce them. Um, that's where we came up with the name uh, Ag Rover, and there's been different um, iterations of the vehicle, but kind of the mature platform that David will talk about more with maps um, is the Ag Rover. came out of kind of the Purdue partnership. We've also replicated the vehicle in other countries, and I'll talk about that in a couple more slides, through different models. And so we've, it's been a unique startup business out of Purdue, still a student project at Purdue, and then through some capacity building grants that we were asked to be part of um, through Purdue or through other organizations. And then last year, David and some other project alumni formed the company, and he'll talk a lot more about MAPS as we get to a future slide. So we're, we really focus on two problems. So the, the project as a whole focuses on transportation and um, farm power. And so, for example, um, majority of the loads carried in, um, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, but developing context in general is manual uh, transportation. In Nigeria, there's 31 vehicles per 1,000 uh, people. And to put that into context, that's Nigeria because that's where MAPS and David is working. But that's not actually cherry-picked because it's a really low number. Um, David and I were recently in Ethiopia. That's three cars per 1,000 people. Cameroon, where we started, is 14 cars per 1,000 people. You might be wondering, then, what is that compared to the U.S.? The U.S. is about 800 cars per 1,000 people. So very different. So our, and our goal is not to give a to have a car for everyone. That's not necessarily the sustainable model we want to. But certainly there's inequitable access to transportation that really influences the smallholder farmers' access to markets and so forth. The second area that we really focus on with the products that we're working on is farm power. So 70 percent. The so general. This is again everything's kind of a big survey of general sub-Saharan Africa. But 70 percent humans, 25 percent animals. And so if you add those two numbers together that only leaves 5% for mechanization. 
Now, granted, there are some large um, commercial farms, but the majority of the work is still being done by smallholder farmers with limited access to mechanization. Um, and I think it was, you know, in the previous presentation, we've kind of found the same thing, that there's some, you know, you can do pedal-powered or human-powered ones, and there's a, there's a market for that. But if they have access to um, petrol or renewable energy, but something that's not bad, that human-powered, they would much rather have that. And so we're, we're, we have projects that are going to be focusing on some different areas of that. The, the mature solution where we started, I, and I, I'll talk about mature solution because we have products in the pipeline I'll talk about in a couple slides, is the Agrover. So it came out of the Purdue project. Um, David's been doing more work on that um, with our partnership in Cameroon and other places. But essentially it's a simple vehicle, uses commonly available parts, um, five-speed transmission, the 26 kilometers per liter if you're in the U.S. That, that's roughly 60 miles per gallon depending on payload and terrain. Um, it uses automotive suspension and brakes and tires, so um, the brakes are, you know, fully um, automotive quality. That it's not putting you know motorcycle or go kart type of brakes on there. The engines can we use a variety of engines, petrol and diesel. Um, but the kind of the unique part on there, the vehicle hauls 2,000 pounds, um, only weighs about half that, a little over that. So. 600 kilograms may be empty, carries 1,000 kilograms, so it's a very efficient way to carry payload. But we use the same engine to drive the vehicle, but also to attach um, implements on there. So we have done corn or maize grinders, water pumps, you could put a generator on there. Um, they, they've attached the threshing machine, and Guinea, they've attached a rice harvesting machine that they've adapted and put on the front. Um, and the engine is one of the more significant cost items on the, the vehicle, but also maintenance and wear. And so it allows us to get multi-purpose out of uh, one vehicle platform. And also the, the business side of it is it provides income revenue opportunities, not just like say during harvest time or during a, a season. So you can see, I, I don't know if the videos are running or not, but um, you can see on the upper uh, left some uh, light tillage equipment, uh, the off-road capabilities in the upper right, a water pump actually in Cameroon right now running um, in the lower left and then just on the roads in the rural areas and uh, the lower right picture is also Cameroon. Like I said, we've also done corn grinders, threshers, in Guinea they've attached a rice head. Um, in Uganda they've done some tillage testing with it with a um, disc plow. And so again, it's it's got compromises in some different areas, but we've really been trying to work on a multiple value stream for there. So as I talked about, the Purdue Utility Project, or acronym PUP team now, um, is still active. And so every year I have a group of um, anywhere from, I would say, 10 to 25 students. It depends on, on the number of students that sign up for the, the projects. And we, we're kind of always looking ahead. So now that the, the Ag Rover is um, being commercialized by MAPS, um, and what we're kind of learning a lot through MAPS and their commercialization, and so we saw an opportunity for more smallholder farmers, not service providers, to have like a personalized vehicle. So we've been working on what we're calling internally right now mini pup, which is about a third of the cost and about half the capability of the um, Ag Rover, but simpler to make, still 100% locally available in country. And we're also working on um, some electric powered vehicles. So we're putting um, electric motors and batteries on a couple of the older um, Ag Rovers and doing some testing on that with the idea that even though it's not cost effective right now, we'd love the option to have solar charging during the day or where we're at in Cameroon has a hydroelectric plant that they could charge it up at night when the electricity is not being used for anything and um, move more to a renewable energy based um, mechanization. So again, there, there's not a financial case for it yet, but we'd love to down the road be positioning ourselves with projects that and products that MAPS can commercialize that, that you know, are, are sustainable both environmentally and uh, energy based wise. So the last slide here, I'll turn it over to David halfway through this slide. We started in Cameroon. We've got five vehicles running there. They've had an order for five from the um, government for a refuse collection that, that are pretty much done, um, ready to be delivered. Uh, in Uganda, we worked with Makerere University, um, had one of our project alumni go to spend a couple months there, work with their um, ag and bioengineering students and faculty, set up a workshop and built some there. And they've done some plowing and testing with that and are um, testing the vehicles with us there. In Guinea, it was a USAID Windrock um, capacity building where we went and set up a uh, um, 
kind of a university mechanization workshop and then taught the design skills. And then as the way to implement the design part of the class, we built one in the workshop with the students there. David was with me there. And the fun part about that is three months later, or six months later, they sent us some pictures where they've adapted the design and put a rice harvester on the front, something we have no um, experience or even ability to test in the United States. But that was a need that they had, and they figured out how to connect to the engine and power a rice thresher head um, to do that. So that's been kind of fun. But those were all kind of both student projects and kind of applied extension projects with the different funding models. Um, David started then MAPS with um, colleagues of his also from the team and, and a, um, another student from uh, Nigeria. But just the, the really quick background, I don't want to take too much time, but David joined the team I think in 2012 as a sophomore um, agricultural engineering student, got involved in projects, took a leadership role his senior year. Um, had, he's been to Cameroon more times than I have now both as a team and a staff person. Um, it kind of just really had a, had a heart for international work even at the beginning, but really developed his skill set. And it's been really fun to watch him grow through as a student. Then he stayed on for grad school and kind of helped me um, run the team and then did the thresher project. And I gave him the option to work on the vehicle. And he said, no, I need to learn more about threshers. And, and you'll see his work he did on that. So it's been really fun to see the students come through the projects and now I'll run the company maps. And so David will talk about where they're at in Nigeria and uh, Kenya and, and the model that he's working on. So I'll turn it over to him and uh, you'll enjoy him more than, than me. We'll see about that. <laughs> but it's actually 2010 when 2010, I got involved okay. with the project, so it's been a few years. And um, just a throw out for those of you in faculty and staff positions at universities, just get students involved and it can make a big difference, So at least for the student. So. Um, yeah, as John said, I did my bachelor's and master's at Purdue, and now we've started up a company called Maps, which I'm going to talk about for a couple of minutes here, and then get to the Thresher. Um, we'll still we'll still talk about Threshers here. So, um, I did a project last year in Kenya. We worked with a uh, small school for uh, vulnerable youth to build one of our ag rovers there, and in fact, during that time, I got to visit uh, Uganda and then Imara Tech in uh, Tanzania as well. So I uh, got to meet uh, Elliot's teammates there. Um, but most of our focus for MAPS, the company, has been in Nigeria. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, last year, we started up a, some small, very small operations. We have an uh, operating workshop um, with four technicians that are fabricating um, our design. We've trained them over the past 10 months or eight, eight to 10 months or so. And um, you can see, it, hopefully, the video in the bottom there showing, or the bottom left picture, showing the completed vehicle. Um, that was earlier this year, the first one that we completed uh, in Nigeria specifically. And it's operating now, uh, you can see the pictures on the right, on a palm, uh, palm oil farm. And, uh, Near Calabar in East uh, East Nigeria, and uh, that that's made a big impact on the farm as opposed to transporting about maybe 100 kg max on a motorcycle. He's able to carry up to 1,000 kg uh, with the Ag Rover, um, easily getting into the rough terrain of the, the forest there. Um, so yeah, so we've been working in Nigeria. We've uh, Again, we're still relatively small, um, but we are in kind of a continuous fabrication uh, process. We're learning a lot about uh, what it means to locally manufacture and um, the benefits and, and challenges of, of that, which I want to talk a little bit more, more about uh, soon in a minute here. Uh, yeah, that's the next slide. <laughs> so um, this is a little bit of transition to uh, to talking about the, the threshing machine, but I wanted to have a short you know, discussion on local manufacturing. That's something we promote. That's something we are, um, we are for, is local manufacturing. Uh, we think it's going to be a big positive thing to get mechanization into uh, the hands or accessible to smallholder farmers. Um, there's a lot of ways it can reduce cost. As I think most of you are probably aware of kind of the, the general benefits that, we, that are, are understood. Um, imported equipment, we've probably all identified some that's, uh, whether it's four-wheel tractors or even two-wheel tractors or threshing machines that um, due to certain um, 
parts breaking and not being able to find a replacement part, um, the whole machine has been uh, left to rust in the field or on the side of the road. And so um, imported equipment um, has been a challenge uh, to maintain and sustain, especially when it's maybe purchased in one batch order and uh, never, no supply chain for replacement parts develops. Um, but that, if you compare that to local manufacturing, we can decrease costs. Um, local labor is often uh, uh, cheaper than maybe labor uh, in industrialized countries. Um, you can also, as, as Elliot was talking about, have better feedback with the farmer and the actual customers so you can design and implement suitable equipment that, that fits the local context that um, meets the demands of the community and because you're able to hear the feedback from the customer. Um, it's more easily maintained locally. Um, there's a little bit of accountability, as Elliot also was mentioning, uh, with the manufacturer being you know, accessible to the customers. They can come back and say, this product did not work. So there's more direct accountability. And um, you can actually implement a warranty program where you may be able to actually maintain the vehicles or the, the equipment um, locally. But also, um, the replacement parts, if it was manufactured locally, it can be, you know, the, you can find the parts there or at least supply the parts to, to fix the machines. And of course, there's definitely benefits for the local economy through the employment and business aspects of, of, of operating manufacturing in the community. But I think one thing um, communities like this webinar series and in development we need to talk about is some of the challenges that do come with um, local manufacturing and um, to understand that it's not all um, as easy or as, as good as maybe it sounds. Uh, there are challenges. And so the first, first thing I look at is, is to ask the question of how local is local? And um, does it need to be manufactured within the village that it's being used in, within the same state, same region, same country, um, within East Africa, within Africa? What do, what do we mean when we say local? And, uh, and when do the benefits uh, when do, do we, when do we lose the benefits uh, that we talk about when we talk about local manufacturing? Um, that that can be a challenge. And efficiency is also something that you may lose as you go into more of a specific localized manufacturing. As far as efficiency in the production line, uh, we know uh, China is the best example. I think of uh, can be very efficient at producing large quantities of manufactured goods in a short period of time and. And that does bring up the next uh, future question of quality, but um, efficiency can be lost when you're doing small quantities locally. And so um, is, that, is that going to increase the cost, which is the next question. Um, costs can sometimes increase when you're doing local manufacturing. If you're buying um, it, parts for 10, 20, 100 even, uh, 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 machines or, or ag rovers, whatever it may be you're producing, are you going to get the same cost benefits as you would if you're producing a, maybe a thousand at a time? So while you may gain you know, some, some uh, cost reduction uh, for certain aspects of local manufacturing, there's going to be maybe cost increase in other ways. And then finally, I think the last and, and maybe one of the trickiest ones is the quality. And uh, this can be a this can be a challenge for a few reasons. One, we've found as we're manufacturing in Nigeria that you have to be, uh, you always have to be careful, regardless of where you're manufacturing, but you have to be careful about the, the materials you're using and the, the quality of those materials or parts. And so we've found both, you know, good quality bearings and we've found bearings that break when you drop them on the ground. And um, sometimes you can't tell by just looking at a part on the outside, the quality of the materials on the inside. So. Um, that, that can be a challenge when, you're, when you go into uh, manufacturing in very small scale, um, very locally. And then, again, the fabrication process. Who's going to be watching to make sure that you're producing a consistent uh, uh, product uh, that has the same results every time you're building it? So if you want to sell a threshing machine that you've determined to be 95% efficient, then if you're not watching the manufacturing process, if you're not checking the tolerances, then how can you, how can you be sure that you're still selling machines that are 95% efficient if you're not, if you're not checking that locally? So um, 
I think there's a lot of pros to local manufacturing, and the way uh, Maps, the the business we're working on, is is looking at doing it is is within Nigeria. We think we only need one manufacturing facility for taking care of the whole country and being local enough that we we're we're accessible to the farmers and the the agricultural community within Nigeria, but we don't need to be in each state necessarily building the same uh, same vehicle on. Uh, Different different assembly lines. Uh, I think we lose efficiency at that point. So, um, just on this slide, people will probably ask what we're selling the vehicle for. Um, we're looking at well, currently the current price is 1.8 million naira in Nigeria, which is about 5,000 US dollars, depending on what day you look at it. And um, the vehicle, as John talked about, can do uh, transportation up to 1,000 kg. It can um, power attachments, so the multi-purpose aspect of it, and uh, pole field implements. We've done some cultivation, some plowing, and some planting with, with the vehicle. Um, and as far as MAPS, the company, we want to get not just into producing the ag robot only, but we want to expand to other technologies that both are kind of related to the ag rover as far as attachments, but also um, expand beyond that to all kinds of agricultural machinery. But now um, I want to talk a little bit about the threshing machine that I designed. This is my thesis project um, at Purdue University. Um, I put the link in for those of you who have uh, access to ProQuest. Uh, thesis for this project is available there. Um, so I did a little bit of background research in Ghana, looking at some of the current uh, options, what are manufacturers doing there, how are farmers threshing their crops there? Um, it was a short short trip, but I learned a lot. And based on that, um, I went to design this machine targeting smallholder farmers. And um, I would say there's 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 a few unique things maybe about the design. But as as Elliot said, the threshing <laughs> threshing process has been around for uh, more than a hundred years. And while you know things have improved over time, and and there's uniqueness maybe. For each one, um, I think one thing hopefully that I can emphasize a little bit is the way we tested it at the end, so that we can have more ability to quantitatively compare different threshing machines um, in the future. So this was one prototype built at Purdue University. It's not been replicated anywhere else at this point, um, and I would probably not build it like this again if I were to build another one. So, but let's go through and just see. Um, what I have here. So again, we wanted to focus on sub-Saharan Africa, smallholder farmers, make it multi-grain, and we were focusing on corn and soybeans for one reason. It's they're very available here in Indiana for testing with. And second, um, cowpeas were one that we really wanted to to test with, but soybeans were similar enough that we wanted to, if we made it uh, work with soybeans, we wanted to, uh, we thought that would be good enough to, to to then in the future be able to test with cowpeas and hopefully it'll work with that. And then of course um, with the same sort of model of locally manufactured, something that we use local materials, uh, simple fabrication process, that type of thing. Uh, these pictures are from uh, traditional threshing and winnowing in Ethiopia. Uh, this is the final product. I powered it with a six and a half horsepower uh, petrol engine just like I think Amaratech uses, similar similar engine, um, but the idea with this is that it could really be any any power source. So as you can see, the engine's hanging off on the side. You could have connected this to an electric motor with a belt. Uh, you could connect it to the Ag Rover, powered it off, off the Ag Rover with a belt. So the idea was to make it a flexible power source, but to have the threshing unit be the same. And use uh, belts, pulleys, and we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, here's a little bit more of the guts with cross-sectional cuts to see the insides of the design. I chose an axial flow um, with combined rotary separation within that um, drum cylinder and uh, rasp bars is for the less aggressive but uh, able to thresh most types of crops, um, more crops than, than other types of uh, uh, beaters or, or other types of uh, threshing drums. And you can see there's a, a a fan at the bottom, and that's blowing air across for the winnowing process. The yellow um, part is a sieve on the top, 
So it's a a sheet piece of sheet metal with lots of holes in it, perforated steel. It allows the small corn to fall through, uh, small uh, grain to fall through, and it's actually vibrating back and forth. So it's oscillating at a certain frequency, and then of course the drum is rotating. Those are the three moving parts. Um, primarily, we use just simple simple parts, belts, pulleys, bearing shafts, it's pretty common. Uh, rebar was used for some of the some of the parts to, to make the lower concave and uh, to make some of the uh, helical guides on the t upper concave and to make the rasp bars as uh, rebar kind of mimics the, the rasp bars that you would see on a combine uh, a little bit. And we also use some other things like perforated sheet metal, so maybe a little more specific Here's um, just a quick summary of the flow of material through the thresher so you can understand a little bit of the design. And uh, you can see all the material coming in the top. It rotates uh, helically through the threshing drum. Um, and the bulk mog, mog being uh, material other than grain. So the bulk mog, the large pieces, go at the end. Uh, small mog, the chaff, and the grain all fall through that lower concave. Then the small mog uh, shakes off the end of that, that uh, sieve while the chaff and the grain fall through and then the wind blows the chaff out while the grain still is the last thing con to continue through. Um, here's the drivetrain. Uh, just quick summary. We have again three moving things. That's the, the fan, the, the oscillating sieve, and the threshing drum. And they're all driven by belts. Um, one had to be rotated 90 degrees, the threshing drum, as it's 90 degrees to the other, the other shafts. So the belt is actually twisted. It's a twisted belt. And you can see the running speeds in the bottom there. Um, the drum's rotating uh, about peripheral speed of 12 meters per second. The sieve was oscillating at 10 hertz. And the airspeed was about 9 meters per second. All right, so for testing, that's kind of what I wanted to get to. Uh, we went through a, a batch batch process. So I weighed out grain ahead of time, the bulk, you know, all, all together. And what I was putting in was for maize was full cobs with the husks on them, um, dried, of course, on the stock. And then for soybeans, we had full stocks of soybeans um, put into the threshing machine. So I'd weigh out that material ahead of time turn the machine on, run it through the machine, and then uh, measure from those four different locations what had come out. So uh, the grain bin, the exit chute, the ground, and what's left in the thresher. So in each of those places, I measured how much grain was there and how much mog was there. And that's what I used to compare, uh, to compare results. And so just to understand kind of maybe how that, what I'm looking for, what I would ideally want is 100% of the grain to be in the grain bin and 0% of the mog to be in the grain bin. That's really what I, I'm targeting. That would be an ideal threshing machine is to produce these results. So let's look through and see what we got. So for maize, um, you can see just a few pictures with that, but uh, we got 96% of the grain in the grain bin and about 7%, and this is all by weight, by the way, by mass. Is all by mass, uh, measured by mass. So about 7% of, of uh, the mog was in the grain bin. And uh, most of that was actually some, a, a few large pieces got in there, so it was easily removed. Um, but th that is the results. So overall, it's a, comparatively, that's, that's actually pretty good results. And then uh, again with soybeans, this was 94% in the grain bin um, with a little bit larger amounts of mog um, falling into the into the grain bin as well. Although most of it ended up on the on the ground. So um, in summary you can see kind of the efficiency. So the threshing efficiency means uh, how much of the 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 kernels were actually threshed, the pods or the, the maize coming off the the cob. So um, for corn that was hundred percent regardless of where it went. So all the all the maize was, was threshed, it came off the cob. Most of the soybean pods were, were broken open and the, the seeds came out. 
Um, there were some grain losses that was measured by what goes on the ground or outside of the grain bin. And um, the feed rates, I will point out, are not really good for comparing in this case. Um, what I was doing was a batch process, um, and that's going to really hurt the feed rate numbers. And secondly, the feed rate uh, was limited primarily by the input chute. You can see in the picture, it's a very small, narrow opening, which was a poor design. It has been modified since then, but not tested quantitatively since then. Um, so really, it was limited not, not by power, not by uh, the mechanics of the machine working, but rather just the input chute and me being able to push the material into, the, into that. Um, this is the breakdown of all the costs of the parts in there. Uh, it totaled up to around 700 or so dollars. Um, but this is, this has to be taken um, not too seriously. All these were one-time purchases from, some of them from, you know, online ordering, some of them from research machine services, uh, providing small amounts of steel. So these costs are probably about as high as they would, uh, as they would get. Um, not very efficient uh, ways of purchasing, but this is this is what I spent to build the machine. And and so as far as some of the challenges and looking at the, the future, the feed rate is definitely one of the ones that went, needed to be changed the most. Um, again, like I said, it was modified some, but it hasn't been tested yet. Uh, we never were power limited by the six and a half horsepower engine. Um, the, the threshing drum never got jammed. It was never bogging down. Um, there are limitations to this testing method. And so when you, when you measure out, you dump it in, and then you count at the end, um, that's actually not going to be exactly what you're going to see when you, you're running this continually. So what would be ideal is to, to, to measure at steady state. So when it's at full capacity, then you want to measure um, these different variables. But it becomes much more difficult to isolate and to measure these variables as it's running at steady state. So it's kind of a com compromise to do the batch process, um, but um, it does get reasonable numbers out of it. And I wanted just to quickly show I did a little bit of work in Zaria, Nigeria, Zamaru College of Agriculture. Um, they had many threshing machines. But they wanted to work on something that would actually be uh, something they could implement. So I worked with them doing a Winrock funded or USAID funded Winrock project. And we did went through the whole design process. I don't know that I brought too much in new information for them, but um, they were able to put their heads together and come up with a design, model it in 3D, and then uh, they've been building it. And I've not heard the results of any testing yet, but um, I think overall that was a positive experience for them and you know I'm open for any questions for either of us um, about Agrover maps Purdue projects or the threshing machine so <laughs> covered, a lot of stuff. covered a lot of ground here thank you both very much that was an excellent presentation um, let me s open the questions now and see if we've gotten any in mine is Um, okay, uh, it looks like um, some of those, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and submit them now. Um, okay, on the threshing machine, somebody wants to know, would you foresee using an adjustable chaffer sieve? So, uh, like, well, I guess one that adjusts, uh, like you see on U.S. combines for different grains. Yeah, uh, in, in fact, that change was made by an undergraduate student, but hasn't been tested yet. My concern with that was with adding complexity and cost to the design. So, unless it proves to have significant uh, efficiency or uh, grain loss benefits, then I, I don't think that would be worth worth the investment. But it hasn't been tested yet. But the sieve, the sieve tray is pretty easy to swap out. Um, so the, the, the design allows for that. And also, you might want to mention, you built in adjustability yeah. in the concave clearances. That's so pretty easy to adjust for different grains, too. 
yeah, I forgot to mention that that the the lower concave can raise and lower for different. Uh, of course, the maize you want a little larger clearance, and the soybeans less clearance, and then uh, that yeah, the, the the perforated steel with the holes can be swapped out with different size steel. Is um, I know so you you have you made the uh, your thesis available to people if they can access it. Um, would you consider this an open source design then? Um, I, I mean, it's not been published, and the design is not really out there. Um, I would be happy to share what we've done, but like I said at the beginning, I would not replicate this myself. Um, I would, I would, I would definitely change things before um, I publish this or sent this out or made this available for other people publicly. Okay, but um, so how would you feel about becoming it becoming publicly available for uh, other entrepreneurs to pick it up? At this point, I mean, we haven't done anything with it, and uh, we haven't actually decided what we would if we would do that for sure. Make it open openly. Available. Okay, so and we, somebody, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Most of the instructions to build it would be in there. I think what David's kind of just saying is. The, what we learned building it and testing it the first time, there should be a second or third iteration before I would, would sell it as a design for people to make and expect it to work as it should. Okay, and what, besides the um, opening size, what would you change? So, the, yeah, the opening size, and that was, that was changed. Um, there are some other modifications, like uh, it was actually, it was pretty heavy. So if we could find out what materials could be reduced in thickness or um, don't need to be there at all, uh, that would be great to remove it. This is not a machine you could throw on the back of the bike like Elliot's. Um, this, this weighed more than that. I forget exactly, and I couldn't find the number right before this, but it weighed over 700 pounds, um, so it's a little bit heavy. Okay, and somebody wants to know is is MAPS, where is MAPS registered to operate as a company? Is it registered as a company or as an NGO? MAPS is registered as a company in the U.S. and uh, we are also registered in Nigeria as okay. a limited company. Okay, and um, we do have a question here about uh, um, controlling the moisture of the grain before threshing, dealing with so many farmers, and the question is probably directed toward Elliot, and unfortunately Elliot is no longer on the call because his computer battery went dead. Um, but I don't know if you guys have any comments about um, grain moisture with the thresher? Um, we, we had pretty dry grain when we tested it, and I measured the moisture content, but I did not uh, use that as a variable, so I did not test different grain at different moisture contents. I know that is one of the driving factors of uh, the efficiency of, of a threshing machine, so it definitely matters a lot. And you may promise 95%, but if that totally depends on on what the, the, the moisture content is. So, yeah, it's a big factor, but I don't have, really have much to say about that. Right. And then um, how clean did the final grain get? <coughs> how what? How clean was the final grain? Um, I would assume that's talking about how much mog was mixed in there. Is yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So you can see fairly low amounts of material other than grain in the grain big. Um, so for corn, I think once I removed large cobs, it was 1.3 percent, and soybeans it was 6.6 percent. So more pods we we're able to get in with the soybeans. Okay. And um, on the Ag Rover, you said the price was five, about five thousand dollars in Nigeria. What's the um, what percentage of that is labor versus materials? Um, I don't have that number right in front of me right now, but um, labor is the one of the smallest costs going into it, or relatively one of the least amount of costs. Um, I, I would say less than ten percent of it is labor. Do you know what the proportion is of, of it is is the engine versus the rest of the materials? Yeah, the engine is about 10% of the cost, straight up. Okay. And um, are you, what kind of, like, do you have patent protection, or what kind of protection can you get on your on your designs when you're working in, in Africa? Yeah, uh, we can pursue uh, 
patents if we if we wanted to, but we're actually not going to take that route. Um, we're going to develop and register our trademark and um, base our business off of that. A patent is actually it's, it's a little more challenging with something like the Ag Rover, where um, there's not a lot of very um, unique. I mean, there's unique aspects to it altogether once you put it all together, but it's hard to actually nail down what's patentable. And by the time we actually pursued a patent, which is expensive, um, it could still be replicated by, you know, somebody else at some point. Um, our biggest concern would be uh, people locally replicating it or people from <laughs> China basically replicating it and uh, be all that out. Out cost us basically. Be able to right. sell it at a lower cost. So. Right. And uh, what was your business plan on the Ag Rover? It's um, is it? Do you, will you be um, like? Uh, are certain parts made by certain other companies, or do you do the entire thing yourselves? Yeah. So we at this point we do the entire thing ourselves. We we're not making engines and we're not building gearboxes, so we, we purchased those, but they are um, already locally available or um, we can we can uh, acquire them locally. So, for example, the engine is would be, it's a single cylinder, 10 horsepower uh, diesel engine that is fairly common for things like water pumps or generators and or even things like uh, rock crushers, I think. Uh, so, it it's 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 available from China, and we 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 are actually going to st start importing. We already have started importing directly from China ourselves um, to lower our costs and to get exactly the model we want. Um, but yeah, so we build the whole frame, we assemble the drive line, uh, we do the suspension using some already prefabricated parts that are available in the market. How about the tr the is, is automatic transmission? How do you source that? Yeah, the transmission is a manual five-speed transmission, and it is sourced. Right now, we're using a Toyota Hilux uh, transmission gearbox, and so we we found them available in Nigeria and other countries. But we're also um, looking at importing from from uh, basically replacement parts from China to, to to lower the cost. And the next question is, are there any road regulations required for the Ag Rover by the governments that where you work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we are trying to make this a agricultural vehicle, and we are working on the registration requirements both in Kenya and in Nigeria. Um, but yeah, we, we want to make sure that this, this is seen as agricultural equipment and be able to take the benefits of that as that is the main purpose of this vehicle. Um, but yeah, to be able to use it on the road for short periods of time is will be important, and we are looking into those registration requirements. Okay, and somebody else says they work from Ghana and have serious issues to get U.S. dollars to do business. How do you manage to solve the U.S. dollar shortage? So they're in Ghana. They're having they're they have a shortage of dollars to do business. Yeah. Um, right now, our our business is more or less bringing dollars into Nigeria, so it's we're not having the problem of, of getting dollars in Nigeria and taking it out at this stage. So uh, we are not affected by the dollar shortage, but it is an issue for businesses in Nigeria that are importing equipment uh, as their business model at this point. And how do you offload produce from the Ag Rover? Is it only done manually? Yes, it is not a dumping bed. Uh, it does not lift. It, it would have to be manually done. Yes. Is is making a dumping bed um, something on your horizons or? Uh, we actually we did one in 2011, and our partner in Cameroon, um, they used it a couple of times, but they did not seem very interested. But it was a manually dumping bed, so you had to lift it manually with maybe one or two people, depending on the size of the load. Um, and so based on that, we just never pursued that, and now we have our bed integrated in with our frame, so it would be a little bit more challenging to, to incorporate a dumping bed design, but um, we, we are keeping that in mind, and I would be interested if people, uh, if there are farmers or uh, people in, in country that 
want that, I would be very interested in hearing that feedback. Okay, and another question is, um, back on the thresher, somebody felt that the capacity for the soybeans was kind of low. Do you think you'd be able to bump up the cap capacity without compromising efficiency? Yes, uh, the capacity for both of them was very low, and and again, that goes back to my point that the limitation of that feed rate, that capacity is the other word for that, is yeah. is me being able to get the, 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 the corn cobs or the soybeans into the threshing drum. So that was the limiting factor. I think the machine itself could handle much higher uh, flow rates, but I don't know what those are because I was limited by that feed, that right. initial issue. So yeah, the the engine never loaded down, but also I'm not sure it was clear. We're throwing in the entire stalks or the corn with the husks on there too. So trying to get the stalks with the koi bean, the pods on the stalks, getting the stalks bent into a shape to get into the shoot was really difficult. Okay, um, and then back to the dumping bed. Somebody commented that uh, a dumping bed would work very well if you wanted to target the cocoa harvest. Hmm. Okay. Dump which uh, I think is pretty big uh, agricultural operations in some areas of West Africa. Um, yeah. let me see. I think that that is the, all the questions that we have, so I want to thank you guys both again for, for talking, and I want to thank all the participants for um, attending the webinar. Uh, in, I think, August 2nd is our fourth webinar, and this will be on the Ogun tractor, which is a unique open source design tractor um, the company is looking for people to participate with them to build um, uh, add-on uh, uh, implements and to build um, uh, different types of agricultural equipment around their uh, power base. So that will be an interesting talk and I hope to see you guys all then. So thank everybody again for speaking and for participating and we'll see you guys in a month. Thank you. Thank you.